Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first uh, uh, keynote session that we've got today at the um, Joint Contact and NNPCF uh, conference. As you all know, this year is a little bit different. And we can't be with you in person. Um, my name is Maruno Sosodio, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the National Network of Parent Care Forums. And today, I'm really, really pleased to have the pleasure of um, having a conversation with um, Russell Viner, Professor Russell Viner. Um, and I'll be putting some of the questions that you have sent in to us, to Russell. We also have um, a chat box and a question function you should, ha should have available. So if you have any questions for Russell as we go, please put them in and we'll do our best to, to, to address them. So with no further ado, um, I'll pass over to you, Russell, to say a few words of introduction. Thanks, Myrnal, and good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, this one is a, yeah, I like the idea of having a conversation rather than me having to give a lecture. We thought I would just give a, a couple of minutes at the start to tell you who I am and what I do. Uh, and then Marino's going to ask me uh, questions on your behalf. So uh, look, I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I see patients uh, every week still, uh, though I have a range of other jobs. One of them is as president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and that's the professional body for pediatricians uh, in the UK. We have nearly well, about 20,000 members, actually internationally across the world. Uh, we also have a very strong um, advocacy campaigning arm. So in many senses, we are the one of the peak voices for children and young people's health. I um, I'm um, part of the NHS Transformation Board for Children and Young People. I'm the vice chair of that board. And I was very pleased to be involved with helping to think through the long term plan um, for the NHS in England to get children and young people into that plan and actually be part of the system that starts to try and change things for children and young people. So I'm hugely pleased about that. I'm also a member or I chair the stakeholder council for the Transformation Board, which is where I've met Marinal, um, or met him more recently, because we certainly met in the past. And I'm also a member of the NHS Assembly, which is uh, the NHS England trying to listen to a range of people from uh, patient advocates, patients themselves, parents, carers, uh, through to um, healthcare workers, academics, etc. cetera. Uh, during this COVID epidemic, uh, we've done in the college a huge amount of work with all of the, well, NHS England, Public Health England, Department for Education, a range, you know, trying to focus on protecting children and young people. And I've been part of uh, Bits of Sage, so the um, scientific group um, for emergencies in that, providing some advice to government on what they should do about children and young people. My work on SAGE has not been the bigger picture, when to lock down and how to do it stuff. It's been apps only focused on children and young people. And my particular focus there has been around schools and COVID um, in, in the broader sense. So uh, yeah, Marinal, I think I'll, so my clinical um, expertise, back when I started, I started as somebody, as a pediatrician involved in diabetes in particular, um, I have a real focus on young people's health as much as children. So in fact, my title is Professor of Adolescent Health. But certainly for the last 10, 15 years, I think my, my focus has been really very broad across children and young people's health, making the arguments uh, for them in policy and public health. Marino, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. That's, that's, that's great. And it's uh, just interesting, a couple of parallels between what you said there and um, uh, your role and, and, and what we do at the NNPCF. You know, we've had a membership of 20,000 and, you know, our, our membership this year is, is, is likely to be edging towards 100,000. Wow. And, uh, yeah. and whilst that's, that's, that's an in incredible privilege, I sometimes describe it as having 100,000 bosses. Which is the the issue with having it? We are we are very proud to be a membership-led organisation, yes. and, and I think it's very funny when people sometimes draw the pyramid of the NNPCF with the co-chairs at the top, and they say, "Absolutely not, we're the guys at the bottom." The way around. We, we, we spend a lot of time listening, and, and and also a lot of parallels in what you said there around providing a voice for children, and young people's mm. health, and that's yeah, really one of our uh, major roles. Um, can we start with coronavirus? Because obviously we can't get away from that this year, and it, it, no. it, it, 
hands over everything. It's shaded everything that we've done. And, and I just wanted to, to, to just get from you the real, you know, uh, uh, no nonsense. What, what are the basics around it in the sense of do children catch it? Um, how poorly yep. are they when they get it? And how infectious are they? Those are the three big things I think that you know, it would be really useful if you could just talk through your, you know, the, the, the latest understanding of, of those three big questions. Absolutely. Now, key questions and well put. So firstly, do they catch it? And the answer is yes, they do. And I think we've been on a journey with this. And I wanted to start by saying that was a really one of the interesting things I saw recently published in the British Medical Journal was a viewpoint from a man called George Davy Smith, who said, the more certain someone is about coronavirus, the less you should trust them. So I'm going to be a little bit certain, but not too certain. And it's certainly true that for children and young people, our understanding has really changed right from the beginning. Right at the beginning of the epidemic, the reports we got from uh, China, from Italy, from Iran, were that children weren't affected, that they didn't catch it, that they weren't affected at all. And so there's some myths around right at the beginning that children didn't catch it and they didn't pass it on. What we now know is that children do catch this virus, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes um, COVID-19, but they almost never get um, severely ill and they're incredibly unlikely to get so ill that they might be at risk of dying. And I'll come back to that. So it's incredibly rare um, that they get really very ill. What we have realised is that children and teenagers catch it a lot more than we had realised. So that's because they're generally asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means have no symptoms. So it's very possible that, in fact, we know probably about 20% of adults have no symptoms at all when they catch COVID. So, you know, they might have had a, a bit of a headache one day, but they'd really never noticed it. They may have had nothing at all. You test them later, there's evidence they were infected. Actually, for children and teenagers, that's probably about 80% of them. Somewhere 60 to 80%, we think have no symptoms or the absolute such minimal symptoms they're not noticed. So that explains that slight kind of what looks like a paradox, which is, you know, early on we thought children didn't catch it, but you've probably been reading in the news that, that the highest group with the highest infection rate right at this moment are actually older teenagers. Children, younger children have lower infection rates than the older teenagers, but they're still quite up there. And one of the funny things about this second pandemic wave has been, well, apparently funny things, has been looking at uh, the data on who gets infected and it looking like teenagers and children have higher infection rates than the elderly, which is totally the reverse of what we saw for the first wave. And that's just because we're testing in a different way. In the first wave, we only tested people who had symptoms and it's Children almost never get symptoms, so they didn't get tested. We didn't think they had it. If you do population screening, you test everyone in the population, you find a lot of infection amongst children we didn't know about. Okay. I'll come on to the transmission question because that's clearly key. But the there is quite a bit of infection out there, but it doesn't affect children. They have no symptoms. They're incredibly unlikely to get sick. Now, of course, the question is, which children are likely to get sick and how frequently. Now, we think, that, so firstly, you probably members will know that there have been very sadly over 50,000 deaths of adults in the UK due to COVID-19, yeah, hugely sad figures. We think our best knowledge is that there's probably around 25 children and young people that have died with COVID. And I say with, not from, Renal, and I think that's really important because there's no doubt when something is around as commonly as COVID, sadly, we know that children and young people die. Around 5,000 children and young people die in this country every year. A really big number, far too many. A lot of them are premature babies who die in the first day, week or month of life. But there's, you know, probably... 1500 other children, young people who die. Um, so, and some of those 
happened to be infected by COVID when sadly they died. So that's the with bit. People who die of COVID, I don't think we have an exact guess, but I think our best estimate is probably 10 to 12. And the signal that we get, well, I mean the signal, what we understand is that probably the only conditions that put you at real risk of very severe illness and death are children who have a combination, and some of your members will, children will be in this group, I do understand that, who have a combination of severe neurodisability and respiratory or lung problems. So that might be a young person with, for example, very severe cerebral palsy or severe neurodisability who also has a tracheostomy and has and needs assisted ventilation. We know that some of those young people are at higher risk. However, we also know that they were at higher risk of um, being carried away by influenza, the flu, in most winters. And in I fact, if that's a really interesting comparison, also, because I read, I think I read somewhere, I think it might have been on on the um, on, on on the uh, Royal College's website that actually the the um, mortality rates for children uh, for COVID are very similar to the seasonal flu. Yeah. So, firstly, there's been no change to our overall children's mortality rate. COVID, as you know, has affected the adult mortality rate, but actually for children. It hasn't, it hasn't hasn't shifted because mortality from car accidents and a whole range of other things are down. So COVID has, you know, there's a little bit there from COVID, but we lose on average 16 young people um, in a winter to um, seasonal influenza. Now it's one of the things I think most people just do not know. We see the flu or influenza as something that's just ordinary a bad cold and actually the truth is it carries off around 16 young people every year on average some years worse some years better so in that sense that i think our understanding is those young people who are on assisted ventilation severe new disability they're very vulnerable probably to any type of winter virus and there's a some sense in which covid is just another one for them now there is this thing called pims ts you're, you're probably, members have probably heard about the fact that back in May, we discovered a relatively new condition that appears to be linked to COVID that we think has affected around 200, 250 children across the UK. That's when the body's immune system, which is what we fight disease with, totally overreacts and overreacts to such an extent that it starts to damage other parts of the body, such as the heart, um, in particular, the blood vessels or the brain. So, or the skin. So, um, the good news is, great majority, in fact, almost all of those children and young people were successfully treated and went home. We believe that probably two children, um, two to three, um, died as a, as a result of PIMS TS. It appears to be, as I said, an over reaction of the immune system. The risk factors for PIMS TS we don't really know as yet but we don't think that they're related to neurodisability or special needs at all. We think it's probably more of a genetic issue with, a, with an immune system that's programmed to overreact. Does that make right. sense? So very few children. So I was gonna say the two signals we know about are people with severe neurodisability plus lung problems. So it doesn't seem to be just neurodisability or just lung problems. In fact, there's some evidence that children with asthma seem less likely to get COVID. It's only one study. I'm not sure that's true. Right, okay. But there's, there's some interesting, interesting issues out there. Children with cystic fibrosis, for example, don't seem to have a higher risk from COVID. Cystic fibrosis is a severe lung problem. Children with diabetes. So the things that are there in adults, it's possible that severe obesity increases your risk of COVID like it does in adults. The trouble is there just haven't been enough children getting very ill for us to tell that. Yeah. Diabetes in children doesn't, uh, and we're pretty certain about that, doesn't give you the same problems for COVID as diabetes in adults does. Down syndrome in children doesn't give you the same problem as Down syndrome in adults does. And that's really important. There have there been no deaths that we know of in the UK or anywhere across Europe or no severely ill children with Down syndrome uh, under 18. 
whereas as you probably know there's been some reports in adults and, and, and actually, what I actually do want to return to Down syndrome a little bit yeah. and a little later in our conversation. But um, can we can we return to the, the question around uh, uh, what we know about how infectious children yes, are? Yes, of course. So, there's, there's, so, there's, there's, there's the issue that a lot of our members are worried about, which is their children themselves, but also yeah. a lot of our members are, are worried about uh, those children who live with other vulnerable people. Yeah. So I think my my take on it and I'll come back to the transmission question very specifically. My take on it is that actually for children and young people, the risks of COVID are incredibly low, about the same as for seasonal flu, which is, it doesn't say there's no risk, but actually incredibly low. Okay, transmission, do they pass it on? Well, we've been through a real journey on this, let me tell you. Um, and people were saying right at the beginning that children didn't transmit. Well, that was clearly nonsense right at the beginning. We know children are less susceptible to catching it. Even though they catch it quite a lot, they biologically, they're less likely to catch it. But because they mix a lot, children are constantly mixing with each other. Even if they're less likely to catch it, because they mix a lot, yes, they have the, 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 yes, the, I think the jury is still out on transmission. They think the, there are some possibilities are that they are slightly less infectious so that they are less infectious than adults, that they are the same as adults. There's no evidence that they are more infectious than adults. So, but it's clear that they're, they're, what, what is clear is that they're because because children are super spreaders when it comes to flu, right? Yeah. So but and no evidence that they are at the moment super spreaders when it comes to COVID. No. Look, and it's really interesting this one. We tend to see children as I mean, well, you know, in the medical terms, we would say vectors of disease. Lots of people see children as, and forgive me, slightly dirty, mucky um, animals that spread a lot of disease. Um, young children, you know, spit, cough, poo, you know, all of that. Uh, and children do a lot of mixing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of doctors around in particular who see children as super spreaders of everything. And it's, and what's also interesting about schools and nurseries, we know that when you put lots of children together, there's a lot of spread of seasonal flu, there's spread of lice, you know, nits, there's spread of um, impetigo, there's spread of measles, you know, some of these childhood diseases, nurseries and schools are really good at spreading. What's interesting about COVID is that we're not seeing that. The jury is still out, but we're pretty we're confident that children are not super spreaders and that schools are not these incubators of disease like they are for other conditions. And we don't really know why that is. That's really important, isn't it, when it comes to decisions yep. around uh, yep. around uh, schools being open or otherwise. OK, thank yep. you. So there is transmission in school. There absolutely is. Um, it's not to say there isn't. But what we don't see is that schools amplify the pandemic most of, to a great extent, um, particularly for younger children, particularly in primary schools. There's more evidence recently. I think there's new evidence out. We've had to readjust some of our thinking and recognize that teenagers, particularly older teenagers, are playing quite a role in spread. And there is evidence that teenagers, when, when community infection rates are high, infection rates in school are high. And as I said, we don't think that's because schools are amplifying, but if, if infection is high in the community, it naturally comes into schools because everybody has it. And then teenagers will bring that back to households. There's no doubt about that. But we don't think it's an amplifier. And the effect is much, much less for primary schools. And again, I think we've had to readjust our understanding of that for teenagers over the last month as new data came out. However, a lot of thinking about this and balancing this in SAGE and you know, more broadly across the whole country, I think there's a really strong consensus that schools should stay open, but we need to be careful with all of that. And I'm proud that as a country we've got to that situation because let me tell you, there are countries in Europe where the pubs and restaurants are open and the schools are shut. And I think, you know, as a, you know, advocate for children's health, I'm just appalled by that idea. But there are countries in Europe where that's the case. 
and I, 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 I agree with you that it, it talks a little bit about the value set of an of, 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 of a nation, doesn't it? And so, and whilst I do miss a pint, let's be clear about that. I do definitely miss a pint. I, I'd, I'd rather have the schools open. Um, I think you've touched on this, Russell, but but can we can we just be very explicit now and say, say that actually there seems to be a, a, a clear differentiation between the the, the, the older that children get yep. for infectious and yep. um, impacted by the virus they are. Is, is, is that a that's fair? Our, that's our current understanding. It's not securely based on all of the science in the world. I know I, I'm a, I'm. I'm disappointed we're still in that situation nine months into this pandemic and I can certainly say that there's a lot of thinking happening about you know how do we get the data to really give us the answers on this and there are there are studies that are starting up there are other studies really looking at this I, I think as I said this this pandemic constantly surprises us so yeah. The other thing on transmission, and you're probably going to ask me this. So we don't think, so children aren't super spreaders, and we actually think that schools play quite a limited role in transmission. There's something about schools and the way that schools control children's behavior, our quite containing environments yes. um, across a range of environments, that we don't think there's a lot of evidence that schools amplify and transmit a lot. Um, and actually schools, particularly primary schools, may damp down transmission. But transmission can occur between children and children can clearly bring an infection back from school to parents. What do we know? We know that it's possible, we know that it happens and we know that there's some, um, that older teenagers, uh, there's evidence that they're bringing infection back to households more than we thought. We don't have that for primary schools. Right. Um, there's lots of people ask me questions about, you know, vulnerable adults in the family, about extended families, adults with, uh, you know, who are clinically vulnerable and the risks for them. And unfortunately, they're largely unanswerable questions. And I think my my view is that we have to see these things in the round. If we only focused on COVID, you're probably not asking me this question, but if we only focused on COVID, we might close everything that we do in society down. Yes. Put put ourselves in straight jackets, our children in prison in a sense, in, in houses or schools, not let really anybody socialize. Wait till the virus has gone away. It ain't going away anywhere anytime soon. Hope we'll, we might have a vaccine by the middle of next year for a lot of the population, sure. But if we close everything down and wait till the middle of next year, we will have a very damaged children's generation and no and no economy or society left. And, and, and I and think can you it's and, and, a balance there. And, and just to just to explore that point a little bit further, as in as in you know, what sort of impact have you seen? Because I think that we've talked so far about the direct impact of COVID upon children. Can we talk a little bit about the, the indirect impact of our response to COVID yeah. on children? The indirect impact. What what have you what have you seen there? Because I think our members yeah. have seen the impact. Yeah, and it's interesting. I speak about this so much all the time, and it's interesting. Even we have just slightly fallen into the trap of you know talking about the COVID bit. Actually, the impact of COVID on children is, I you know I'd characterise it as collateral damage. Yeah. People know the term collateral damage. That's you know in warfare where you're aiming your rockets at the enemy, but actually you kill all the civilians in the town next to where you are aiming. Um, and those, those civilians are collateral damage. And that's what children have been during this pandemic. Our attempts to control the virus and save the lives of the middle-aged and elderly, as a middle-aged, well, slightly elderly person, <laughs> I value that. Um, our efforts to do that have really produced collateral damage for our children and young people. We started to see this early on. I talked to you before about deaths of children and young people um, uh, with COVID. Back in April, May, at the beginning of this, we knew about around eight to 10 deaths of children and young people with COVID, April, May, June. But we also knew about just as many deaths of children where their treating pediatrician said, I am 100% sure 
that the delay in getting to hospital contributed to this very sad death of this child. And that's death from things like meningitis, um, you know, sepsis, that, that kind of infection, or very late presentations with cancer symptoms, that brain tumour, that kind of thing. So even right at the beginning, we were seeing probably as many children dying from the way we essentially shut down the health service and parents and everybody obeyed the government, stay home, protect the NHS. They didn't bring their children. So there was the delayed presentation harms. We think through lots of different effort by people and lots of education campaigns and things, we think that's gone. We don't think that's now harming children. What else did we do in the first pandemic wave? We stood down the protective, you know, the barricades we put around our children, you know, that we've spent 100 years building up in this country, in many countries. So that's health visitors, social workers, schools, all of the things that we put in place, you know, community physiotherapy, occupational therapy, community nursing, all the things that we have built up to protect our children, we stood down with little regard to those children. All the focus was on protecting the middle-aged and elderly. Um, and it was probably the right thing to do at the time. But I think one of the issues is we must not ever do it again. And that's one of the areas we have been in the college very active on. Whenever yeah. I get to yeah. see a, a minister or Simon Stevens or people at the top of the NHS, it's we must not do this again, the stand down bit, send all our health visitors off to um, white bottoms in intensive care. That's really important that somebody does that, but don't make our health visitors do it. And there was definitely a sense from, from, from um, our cohort that, that, you know, many of, you know, our, our children are, are, are already, already disadvantaged in many yep. ways. And, and, and they were more, and, they were more and, disadvantaged. And, and, yep. and COVID just doubled down on that disadvantage. Yep. Of, in uh, a decision made to protect the elderly and vulnerable in the middle yeah. age. Look, and I that, think that, that, that certainly that, came through in, 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 in the experiences of our families who, who yeah. during lockdown were, were was, some of them were quite shocking and appalling, but and, and even 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 um, um, the, the, those, those that, that, that coped really rather, you know, relatively well, during lockdown had a, a singularly much more difficult time than, than, than they otherwise would have done, yeah. I think that's true. And there was the sense, as there always is, that community services were deprioritized because everybody focused on the acute, which is the right here and now, the sharp end, the emergency. We found that with our pediatricians. We got our acute pediatricians, the, the ones manning the emergency departments back much quicker then we got our community community pediatricians back because yeah. there was just a sense that you know community was less important and as you know community pediatricians and community yeah, nurses we are, we are still finding it we have reports from up and down the country of that a lot of community-based therapy services the uh, the occupational therapists the speech and language therapists the physiotherapists are still not fully restored across the country and certainly not certainly any backlog that has built up yeah. has not been addressed yet so um, have you have you seen have you seen any impact can we talk a little bit um about the impact when it comes to things such as obesity and mental health yeah but, i was going to come on to those yeah so look that's the health service or the, the disease you know the presentation the health bit there's also been all of the other impacts on our children's lives um our children need social contact schools are incredibly important for them for a whole range of things um, the anxiety and concerns of the pandemic really played on them. There's very good evidence that there was worsening mental health amongst children and teenagers during the pandemic. There's a bit of unusual evidence there. I think we know that for some teenagers in particular, staying off school, being at home, you know, some, some teenagers were happier. We have to accept that. But actually, for the great majority, we have evidence of harms. And there's been an in, there's incredibly robust evidence to show that from big national surveys. In fact, they did a big national survey of uh, in 2017 of mental health, and they found that one in nine young people, one in eight to nine young people had a significant children, young people that were five to kind of 16 year olds, 
one in nine had a significant mental health problem. They did it again in July, it was one in six. Right. So that's quite an increase in terms of mental health problems. One of the real concerns we saw early on was a rise in the uh, suicide rate amongst under 18 year olds. The most, the most distressing thing to ever think about, talk about for any parent, probably for any adult, is for a young person to take their own life. Um, we started to hear some reports from the National Child Mortality Database of a potential rise from uh, mid-April. We, and we, we convened a group with NHS England to sit, not to sit on it, to watch it, because it would have been disastrous for us to see one or two weeks of data to go into the press and actually one of the issues is we know there can be copycats, we know that, that the overreacting to suicide can be a problem. So we tracked it for about a month to really be clear that this was what we call a signal, not noise. And it did drop a couple of weeks. We thought, oh, it's okay, came back up again. But we, by mid-May, we had enough evidence to say, we, I'd already made sure the chief medical officer knew about it. I'd already made sure, you know, we'd made sure as a group that the prime minister knew about this. I think it was one of the, you know, it had an impact on the decision to reopen schools, because actually in, in May, it could have gone either way, getting schools reopened, you know, we were part of that real fight to get primary schools in particular reopened. So hugely sad data, it was about a 40% increase. Um, 25 young people took their lives during that February through to late May period, and around half of those and there's good evidence that, that young people were really worried by the lockdown and COVID. Yeah, yeah. So can, we, can, we, can we just return to um, around uh, just, just the, the direct impact of COVID and really around, around the measures that, that we should be taking, in particular around special needs and those with additional needs. Um, uh, can you say something about you know, which which children should be isolating and and and, and in particular uh, the, we we had a lot of concern around um, the um, uh, the clarity around the, the the shift between the approximately hundred thousand children that were asked asked to isolate or or, or, or um, at the early part of the pandemic and now we're being and now that list is is very much smaller. I understand that about ten thousand children are being asked asked to asked to isolate. In the clinically extremely vulnerable. Can you say a little Hello. bit about the clinically extremely vulnerable group? Hopefully, no one's being asked to isolate per se um, in a kind of full-on way. Um, and we have a we have a strong belief that that given the data we have showed, that there is essentially pretty much no child who really should be isolated from all other children and not go to school. Um, I think. That prob the, the exception to that is probably a child with very active cancer treatment who is very immunosuppressed. You know, a child who's presented with leukemia, they are treated with some very strong chemotherapy that knocks their immune system right down. And they're, you know, they're very vulnerable. Clearly, you know, we have always managed them in isolation that, um, during that treatment. So we need to be very careful about them. The, the young people I talked about before, who might have severe neurodisability and lung problems, long-term ventilation. Again, I think we know that they are at higher risk from seasonal influenza or this, you know, this virus this time. Should they be isolating, not going to school and all those sorts of things? I don't think we really think that's, that's the case. We think that schools, we need to make sure that, that there's the balance in life because actually the benefits to them of, of more normal life almost certainly outweighs this slight increased risk from COVID. And, 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 that, and, and, and that, just to drill into that loss, just be really, really, really clear on that. And that includes, the, you know, so we're talking about not, not only the, the, the very vulnerable children with, with complex needs, but also you're talking about those who attend special schools with the much greater physical contact that may that they may, may come across there the 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 the, uh, the personal the care that's required there it includes include, it, 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 what we have a responsibility to do is to make sure 
I mean, we as a society, to make sure that um, those special schools, uh, those that those special schools, a protect the staff and b protect the young people in terms of aerosol generating procedures and places. One of the important things to know is you know, where's the most dangerous place for anybody to catch COVID? And the answer is probably in an intensive care unit treating very, very sick COVID patients. And actually the evidence shows that the nurses and doctors and others in intensive care have a very low risk of catching COVID. Um, the, I suppose that what that shows is that risk reduction really works. It's oh, about I, protecting absolutely. themselves. I, I, I'm not the right person to give you the exact level of PPE, personal protection that person X or person Y should do in the situation in this special school or in uh, this aerosol generating procedure and those sorts of things. I know that they are complex areas. I know that many groups have been working with Public Health England and DfE about that over time. I do very much recognize that. I'm not the right person to give you the specific exact detail of who wears what and when but i think the important thing to know is that you know this this virus it's it's not a clever but it don't it, you know basic really good protection really works is the answer okay um, and, and where, do we, where do we know doctors and nurses have got sick or died from covid and well healthcare workers i should say it's actually mostly people it's not people in intensive care it's not people in the emergency department where you go if you're getting sick with covid so it's not the high risk places they get sick in the low risk places because people aren't focusing on basic protection yes and it's probably similar yeah we think it's similar across across a range of areas can we can we um Talk about sort of Down syndrome, Down syndrome yeah. specifically, because I think that, that we and many others were really caught on the hop by the categorization of over 18s with Down syndrome as clinically extremely vulnerable. Now, yeah. our membership covers that, 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 that yeah. 0 to 25 age group for, for children with and young people with special educational needs and additional needs. Um, and, and that that the, that categorization really caught us on the hop and caught many services on the hop and led to the shutdown again or unilateral shutdown of many services for, for young people with learning disabilities and, and, and yep. down to that period what can we what can you share around that so i mean i think we were caught on the hop by it as well we had suddenly got news so we had been looking uh when i say we that's you know child health professionals, the college, we had been looking at the issue of, you know, all um, children significant with, you know, disabilities, you know, disability, whatever, over time, um, and had not seen any signal from this. We got wind of the fact that there had been an analysis done showing a higher risk of mortality in Down syndrome. So we saw some urgent clarification and it became clear that it was only in, eight, in only in older adults. And so I'm not claiming that we got the clarification, but it became clear that as I understand it, the risk, so that we, I'm not talking here about children with an untreated heart condition, because I think that's, if there's Down syndrome and you have an untreated heart condition, which some, yeah. you know, well, if young people with Down syndrome have a treated heart condition, but if you know if there was a very untreated heart condition, they might be at a different risk category. But straight up, pe young people, children, young people with Down syndrome, um, we clarified that the risk appears to be similar to many of the other mortality risks in Down syndrome. Now, I th this is not my area of direct expertise, but what I understand the biology is that um, that young young to middle-aged adults with Down syndrome often have diseases that will come on in the whole population and at a later age come on in kind of early to middle age in Down syndrome. There appears to be a, you know, you could almost call it a premature aging type of um, 
I use the word pathology, you know, biology there. And that's what happens. We see that happen with a range of conditions in, in young people, young adults with Down syndrome. And what we understand from this is that we're probably seeing a similar thing, is that some of the risk that we normally see in the 17 or 80, 70 and 80 year olds, we're seeing in adults with Down syndrome um, at a much earlier age, for example, I'm, yeah. I'm quoting 40 to 50, but I don't want to upset or, or worry any parents there. But so we're seeing that the same kind of age shift down. What we're not seeing is it going anywhere near young adults and children. Now, I think they put an age 18 cutoff in there because that's how they define children compared with adults. Yeah, that, that is, that is I, exactly the representation I don't we believe, believe well, yes. I don't yeah. believe there's any evidence that young that young people with down syndrome for example 18 to 25 are at higher risk but i think i think when i say they i don't think the nh i think the nhs is trying to do the right thing it's trying to identify a, a group that's at higher risk it in a clunky way says children aren't adults are standard yes. definition is 18 we're going for that and as a college you know ch children and young people you know we can't influence or unable to influence beyond that but as I said, I know of no no issue in teenagers or young adults with Down syndrome. Thank you. And and, and, and we 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 and, and just to be clear, we, we have made very similar representations and we, we read that in the same way as a very simple um adulthood starts at 18 and therefore this is a, a very broad it's a, it's a very broad brush yeah. for, for mixing my metaphors, it's a it's a it's a sledgehammer to crack a nuts approach to this. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, the vaccine? We've had mm -hmm. some questions really around um, the, the vaccination of children and in particular, um, um, whether the, you know, two, two real questions. Just, you know, where, where will children be in the vaccination priority or the list? Uh, yeah. and, 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 and particularly we've had this question around um, the children, young people with uh, learning disabilities and autism. Yeah. So there's been some very disturbing evidence that of, of their mortality rates in comparison to the rest of the population in, um, in, and, in adults absolutely and and um then also just a little bit about is the vaccine safe for children it's particularly those our children who may be on a, a more complex drug regimes and and, yeah. and how will it how does it interact has that has that testing been done around the the, the other conditions so, and other drugs absolutely really good questions um, and I know quite a bit about the vaccines, but I'm not an expert. Uh, and what's one of the things, just to start, one of the interesting things is the people who are leading the vaccine studies in this country are mostly pediatricians. So oh. Professor, Professor Andy Pollard, um, who is uh, leading the Oxford vaccine, uh, is a pediatrician and an advisor to us. And in fact, he's head of the what's called the JCVI which makes decisions on vaccines, though, yes, but that's so coming the, back to the question. Joint Committee on Vaccinations and yes. Immunizations. Immunizations, that's right. So he's had to stand aside at the moment from the JCVI because he can't chair a committee that recommends his own vaccine. Yes. Um, anyway, so children will, at the moment, and I see no chance of this changing, children will be last to be vaccinated. All children as a, as a group. And that's because of what we talked about before, is that they are at almost no risk as a group from this vaccine. We and a number of others, and potentially I imagine yourselves, have made representations to the chief medical officer and others that um, children with uh, special needs, so significant learning disability, those at higher risk, you know, the groups I talked about before, should, should be pushed up the vaccine priority risk. Chris Whitty's response, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, is two. Number one, he doesn't make that decision, it's the JCVI, yeah. which is this joint committee we talked about. And actually, what I, I admire them, what the government is trying to do is take the politics out of this. So Boris doesn't get to decide, um, and the First Minister in Wales and Scotland doesn't get to decide who gets the vaccine. It's done on a very scientific basis by risk. And it's by risk at the moment that they're deciding to do it. And by risk, children will be at the bottom. Now, we 
will continue to make these arguments that there's a very small number of children who were at higher risk and we think and they should with with the the flu vaccine each year there, there was a, there's a there's a group of children that are well, because, prioritized for that and families of children yes. that yeah. are well, all children um up to year seven should be vaccinated against um the flu and get yeah. as can because they're super spreaders so you vaccinate them first as well as the elderly so again it's that difference here now Chris, so the second thing that Chris Whitty has said, every time this, you want to push somebody up the list, someone else will fall down the list. And that's a balance that JCVI will have to make, but just be aware when you're pushing for some for your special group to go up the list, you'll be pushing yeah. someone else's special group down the list. And I get that. So I don't make the decision, the JCVI does. Um, there are two ways of making the decision. Number one, based on risk, or number two, based on protection for the population. What I mean by that is, you know, there's a lot of children, they play some role in transmission. We don't think there's super spreaders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you could argue that you should be immunizing the whole population, that this risk-based stratification is pointless, that you should be in there immunizing children because actually, you know, they can transmit and until they're an immunized group they will transmit to some extent so and i think what 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 i understand is when we don't have enough vaccines they're going on a risk stratification but as soon as more vaccines are available they'll immunize the entire population i can't see children being vaccinated before the summer to be honest it is possible um otherwise but but i think unlikely so the really interesting question about vaccine safety the first answer is we don't know but trials are underway well they are doing some trials of the oxford vaccine at least in children so the children are different children's immune systems are different in fact it is thought that one of the reasons that children get such a mild version of covid if they get it at all is that their bodies are already primed and they have a good immune system their immune system is already primed because of all the colds they catch and things. So it's so it's possible that they'll have just a very good response to the vaccine and it'll be highly protective. There's a minor possibility that they'll respond in different ways uh, that we don't understand. There's no reason to think the vaccine shouldn't be safe. Uh, but, 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 uh, but, but essentially, we, we we will we will have to wait and see to see what the trials and the the the, the evidence um, yeah. shows. Uh, can I I, I, I want to move us away from from coronavirus and that's been that's been a really really clear um, description of, of of the situation that we 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 we, we we we're facing there at all. Can we talk a little bit about spend the next ten minutes or so talking just a little bit about the long term plan? Yeah. Um, that, that there's, there's a lot in the, the, the long-term plan that is very good and very necessary for children with um, uh, additional needs, with special education needs and disabilities. You know, the, the special education needs and disabilities work stream, the learning disability and autism work stream, the mental health work stream, these are all front and center to the concerns that our families um, uh, and, and the, the lives that our uh, families lead all the time. Um, can you talk a little bit about, tell us a little bit about um, to what extent the, the, the long-term plan is almost having, is, is being rebooted and you're um, following COVID and your ambitions to get that rolling again? Yes. So I think like you, we were exceptionally pleased to see children and young people in the long-term plan. Um, actually, the first time... Before... conspicuously absent from the five-year forward view. Oh. Yeah, mentioned three times. Uh, yeah. First time for 15 years that we've had children as a priority and, you know, huge reason for um, enthusiasm, I think. Um, sorry, somebody's banging on my front door and no one else in the house is going to answer it, but I shall ignore it. <laughs> um, uh, what was I going to say? The um, Long-term plan, yes. So hugely, hugely pleased about that. And the long-term plan had a series, you know, there was 37 different commitments in that. And as we say, some real commitments about uh, children um, with disability, with special needs, um, which were very welcome. Everything's been sideswiped by COVID. 
I mean, you know, I think in a sense we put the health service into a hard handbrake turn um, during COVID and it hasn't fully recovered. I, so we work closely with the NHS on this. They are absolutely cognizant, you know, they do know that they need to firstly re-examine the things that we said we would do because it's two years ago now and actually what's been achieved, what, what needs to be different. So there needs to be a re-examination, but there needs to be an acceleration of actually getting it into place and delivery. And I'm frankly a bit worried about our capacity to do that, given the fact that we're coming into another COVID winter, given the stretch I see in everybody's systems. This is not a criticism of colleagues in NHS England. I think they're brilliant and they're working incredibly hard. But I think, you know, we, you know, those of us in your group and, and the college, we need to keep up our, our pressure on NHS England to make sure they deliver on this. We need to be understanding and recognise that they've got an impossibility at the moment, a really busy winter coming up. Um, I think we have to hold their feet to the fire to, as I said, never again stand down the services. That's the least we can expect from this winter. Can we expect improvements over this winter? I think we need to see them starting to focus on that. We need to see and help them get the processes in place to restart. Transformation is the word that NHS England uses, which is improvement in any other words. Um, we need to see the plans for that and some signs that that's going to, to, going to run quickly once this COVID emergency is over. But we mustn't let things stall again. None of them want to do that. But yeah. the capacity in the system, I mean, you know, there's a national clinical director, Simon Kenny, who's brilliant, and he has, there's two national clinical advisors, um, uh, Michelle O'Glocklin, who's a, a nurse, um, and Matthew Clark, who's a paediatrician. And the national clinical advisors, I think, are paid one day a week. I mean, they're clearly working four. And Simon Kenny, I think, is paid three days a week to do this job, and is clearly working about 10 days a week. Um, so, because, yeah, there's just so much for them to do. There is, there are good signs. Um, NHS England has delivered on the money. There's a lot bigger team now in the Children and Young People's Program. Um, as I said, we need to help them make sure they can deliver this. And and and, and a couple of sort of very specific areas from our from our men membership is that the um, you know the that I think that the the learning disability and autism program has has, has really restarted, and we we we're starting to see lots and lots of evidence of that of of, of activity Good. on the ground. Um, and and we are you know we we and our membership are, are being pulled into lots and lots of work there, which is which is great, um, which is yeah. which creates other problems for us with, with, with those of those of capacity. But at a at a national level, can you say a little bit about? representation of parents in particular on on on, on that na national on the, on the national board the, the children young people's board because at the, at the moment I, my understanding is that we have um we we have you know it's great you've got we've got children and young people on that board and, and and that voice is being heard but we are noticeably lacking parental engagement at, yeah. at, at that, and that and that board. But there and is there is really there is a commitment to address that and I think the focus has been on making sure children and young people's voices were heard. Um, and that's, I, you know, I think NHS England has done a lot on that. They've, they have put money into it. They've put quite a lot of focus on yeah. it. And I think there is a recognition that parents' voices are separately important. And in fact, we'll hear, I will hear more about that next week. No, Wednesday, I think. There's a transformation board meeting. Um, and thank you for reminding me to uh, to ask where that's up to. From our, the, the message we get very clearly from our membership is 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 really you know there's there's two groups of children who cannot represent themselves those those who are you know young or, yeah, don't or don't have capacity. Yeah. and also I think that one of the big messages that come through is that parents and children say different things. Which, yep. is the, I think, which is the heart of parenting, isn't it? It's the heart of the conflict with, 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 with the young oh, people. Yeah. Is that, and it's really important that those different things are heard and given um, equal value. One of the things I would say is I'm also a member of this thing called the NHS Assembly. Now, the NHS Assembly is an unusual body. It was formed about two years ago 
as part of the long-term plan process and it's supposed to be a representation of broader healthcare society and it's about both helping NHS England and holding it to account for delivery of the long-term plan. And there are definitely um, parent representatives on the assembly. There's a number of people with, um, and I know this because I hear them speak um, very passionately, a number of people who represent um, constituencies such as uh, children with SEND, um, you know, children, young people with disabilities, you know, parents and carers, and actually carers in particular have been quite a focus of the NHS Assembly. I've had to drag them back to parents a few times um, and point out, you know, anyway, I, I won't go into that in great detail, but there are some differences because a lot of it was focusing on carers of the frail elderly. Yes. Um, yeah. And they often forgot about care, parent carers of, um, of uh, children and young people. But I think that's a group where parent voice is definitely heard and I think that right at the top of the NHS Simon Stevens and others really listen to the academy of uh, the assembly yeah. so but yeah I will yeah. ask on no that's good um I, I think I'm I'm, I'm I'm mindful of time we have we have mm -hmm. spent a very um it's, I think it's been a really interesting informative hour Russell it's it's, I said it's flown by and hopefully our um, yeah, I was going to say I'm a bit shocked it's an hour, but yeah. uh, people who've um, people who've joined us will no doubt have found it really, really useful and informative. And I think you've really helped us to uh, update on some of the latest thinking and knowledge around where we are with coronavirus, and also a little bit of time casting forward uh, to, to to where we might be of the of the coming um, months and years, both with the with vaccines and with um, with uh, uh, the, the long term plan. Um, yep. Is there any final messages you'd like to give to our membership um, before we wrap up? I suppose the final message is that keeping schools open I think has been one of the great achievements that our community has done. I think it's not been easy. I recognise the sensitivities, I recognise the complexity particularly for some of your members, uh, Muriel. I do very much recognise that. I think I have seen the NHS, PHE, even DFE work in different ways, that, um, be much more open, much more able to change rapidly than they have been in the past. Uh, I think one of the things we have to do as a kind of as slight, you know outsiders who help push them and work with them is to make sure they retain that openness of working. I think that's one thing, and I think. For children and young people is always remembering that COVID is actually the direct affection stuff. We can't let that dominate. It's got to be about the whole child and the whole family. Thank and you. That, that's a really good place to leave it because that's very much our mantra as well. You know, please, please, please continue to work with, with children, young people, and their, their, their families and see the whole child, not the, yep. uh, not the diagnosis. Um, Thank you, Russell. I think it's been a really, really useful session. Um, I think our members will well, find thank it. Thank you all. Useful. Thank you all for listening. Uh, and and and, um, and and we've we've had a, a lot of attendees today listening in um, as we um, uh, as we as we've been chatting. But I am absolutely confident that that we will get many more who will watch this back over the coming weeks. So thank you for your time, and um, I look forward to seeing you yes. on one of our um, one, one, one of our future meetings. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for joining us.